Hello everyone and welcome to Layer 2 of the Pokemon Conspiracy Iceberg. Of course, if you did not watch Layer 1, please go ahead and watch it. I'll have the full playlist linked down in the description. I wanted to thank you all for the support I got in the first part. It really blew my expectations for the video's performance all out of the water, and your comments meant a lot to me. I know a lot of you guys really wanted a second part, so here it is. And if you're all caught up, let's get right into part 2. Ultimate Weapons Split the Timeline If you remember from the previous layer, I talked about two major timelines in the franchise, the Mega Timeline and the Non-Mega Timeline, but what exactly was the diverging point? In Pokemon X and Y, it said that during the War of 3000 years ago, AZ fired the Ultimate Weapon. The energy left over from this weapon is what created the Mega Stones. Since one timeline has Mega Stones and the other doesn't, it's safe to say that the diverging point between the two realities is that AZ decided to fire the weapon in the Mega Timeline, but he did not in the non-Mega Timeline, or he didn't even create the weapon in the first place in the non-Mega Timeline. Another explanation is that in the Mega Timeline, the weapon firing created the Mega Stones, but in the non-Mega Timeline, the weapon still fired, but for some reason it did not create any stones. Unknown are the 1000 Arms The 1000 Arms of Arceus are a point of discussion within the community. This theory states that Unknown were actually the Thousand Arms of Arceus. We already know that Unknown have reality-bending power due to the dex entries, and they are a very ancient and mysterious species, so important that humans base their alphabet on them. So perhaps Arceus used these as his 1000 arms to shape the world, and the number 1000 is just an arbitrary number representing something big. Evidence to support this theory comes from the fact that during the Sinjo event, where Arceus is using his creation powers, Unknown show up prominently. Genesect is Kabutops. Genesect is a man-made Pokemon, set in its Pokedex entry to be the result of Team Plasma's modification to a Pokemon that was an Apex Predator 300 million years ago. Well, if we take a look at the fossil Pokemon Kabutops, its Dex entry states that it inhabited beaches 300 million years ago. And looking at those giant scythe hands, it's likely that this thing was an Apex Predator. Both Pokemon have a similar body structure too, having a bug-like bipedal body with a flat head. With all this in mind, we can pretty confidently say that the Pokemon Team Plasma modified to become Genesect is Kabutops. There are physical similarities in the fact that the Dex explicitly states 300 million years ago for both of them is too much of a coincidence. Plus, the slight differences between the two can be chalked up to the modification by Team Plasma. As of right now, I do think this theory is true. Pikachu Speaks in the Pokemon movie I Choose You, there is a scene where Pikachu just straight up speaks English in what was meant to be an emotional scene. However, if you look up reactions from the theater, most people just laughed or were completely confused throughout the scene. Why won't you get more Pokemon? It's because... What? The fuck? <laughs> While the execution of this scene was questionable, I'm pretty sure the creators did not mean for Pikachu to be literally talking here, like Meowth does for example. It's likely that it was more of a symbolic thing, where Ash and Pikachu's bond is so great that they are able to understand each other in their heads. Eternal Flower Floette AZ's Floette has a different color and flower than the other Floette we find in the game. There have been several theories about this. Was it mutated by the energy of the ultimate weapon? Well, no, that's just not true. I don't know why it's a theory. Is it a battle bond Pokemon like Ash Greninja? However, I think that the simplest explanation is the best. It's a floette from thousands of years ago when there were different flowers in the modern day. So of course it would hold a different flower. It's possible that all floette from back then looked similar to the eternal flower floette. Or maybe the royal family floette could hold on to flowers that were specifically made in the royal gardens or something. As for its signature move, Light of Ruin, which other Floette don't get, I think that this move was caused by the ultimate weapon's energy, turning AZ's Floette specifically immortal. Evolutions Became the Beasts In the Johto games, we learned that when the tower burned down, three unknown Pokémon perished in the fire. Later, Ho-Oh visited and resurrected them into the legendary beasts, Entei, Raikou, and Suicune. The identity of the Beast's original forms has been a topic of discussion since the release of Gold, Silver, and Crystal way back in 1999. In Pokemon Generations, we actually see the three Pokemon that died, but they were silhouettes of some 
sort of dog that don't really match any Pokemon we know of. The community agrees that these weren't meant to depict any specific Pokemon, but was rather just a visual placeholder to avoid showing any specific Pokemon. A popular theory is that the three dead Pokemon were the three original evolutions, Flareon, Jolteon, and Vaporeon. I mean, the typings match up perfectly, they're a trio, and the evolutions are all this weird, ambiguous dog, cat, mammal thing, like the legendary beasts. Also, in Generation 5, the beasts were given a hidden ability that matched the abilities of the evolutions, Water Absorb, Flash Fire, and Volt Absorb. However, I will say it's kind of hard for me to believe that a Vaporeon couldn't put out the fire, or at least clear a path through it or that a Flareon of Fire-type died in the fire. <laughs> I mean, we just established that its ability is Flash Fire, which makes it immune to fire. If he actually did end up burning to death, that would be super embarrassing if I was that Flareon. I personally believe that it wasn't the evolutions that turned into the beasts, but rather just three Eevee which died in the fire. They were a weak first form with no elemental powers that couldn't make it out of the fire, and so they all died. Later, Ho-Oh resurrected them, into a fire, water, and electric type to represent the three evolutions they should have evolved into had they not died. Another point that supports this theory is that Ecritic City, where the Burn Tower is located, is also home to the Kimono Girls, who are culturally important to the city, and they all use evolutions, so we know Eevee are important to the city. So it makes sense that the Pokemon that died in such an integral part of the city's history would be Eevee. And going back to Ho-Oh resurrecting them, it's like the wish theory we talked about in Layer 1. These Eevee probably wished to turn into their evolved forms, so Ho-Oh granted that when it resurrected them, but it turned them into much more powerful water, fire, and electric. Wobbuffet's tail is its head. Wobbuffet is an interesting design for a Pokemon. Its body is a giant blue blob, and it has a black tail. Interestingly, its tail has two eyes on it, which is the basis for this theory. For those of you who don't know, the whole gimmick of Wobbuffet is that it's designed to take hits and hit back harder with moves like Counter and Mirror Shot. It's a literal punching bag of a Pokemon. So if you were literally designed to take hits, why would you attract attention to your head? This theory states that the face you see on Wobbuffet's torso isn't actually where its real head is, it's just a disguise to get opponents to aim there. Instead, its real head is on, on its small tail, which is out of the way so nobody's going to target it. It protects its real head by not drawing attention to it. Considering that Game Freak intentionally designed its tail to have eyes on it, I believe that this theory is true. Pikachu Level Reset Over the years, Ash's Pikachu has gotten very strong. It was Ash's most trusted partner on his journeys through Kanto, Johto, Hoenn, and Sinnoh, fighting many powerful opponents along the way. And we know it was powerful. In the Sinnoh League, Pikachu fought and defeated a legendary Pokemon. Then why is it that in the black and white anime it lost a battle to a starter Snivy? Well, the correct answer is this long-running anime for kids doesn't necessarily care for continuity like that, and it's forced to nerf Pikachu in order to retain dramatic tension, but that's not fun. So people said that Pikachu got its level reset near the beginning of black and white anime run, which is the exact same thing as nerfing Pikachu. So yeah, honestly I'm not really a big fan of this theory, doesn't need to have a theory made about it. Ray and Akari are Lucas and Dawn. So I've mentioned this before in the previous layer if it, as if it was confirmed, but I guess it isn't in the final game technically. The protagonist of Legends Arceus, the player, is Lucas or Dawn, depending on the gender. This is basically confirmed. There was cut content showing the protagonist's room before they got sent back in time, and this room is the same as Lucas and Dawn's room in the Generation 4 games. In the past, they meet the opposite gender counterpart, Ray or Akari, who could also possibly be their ancestors. The names are confusing here, but the correct way to word this is that the protagonist of Diamond and Pearl is also the protagonist of Legends Arceus. All Pokemon learn Minimize. In some official interpretations of the series, Pokemon get into Pokeballs by literally shrinking down to fit in them. Since all Pokemon have this ability, it can be said that all Pokemon can learn the move Minimize, which is described to shrink the user to make it evade attacks better. If all Pokemon can shrink, all Pokemon technically learn Minimize. Lily likes Elio. In the Generation 7 games, dialogue shows that Lily expresses a desire to spend time with Elio, the male protagonist. It's heavily implied that she has a schoolgirl crush on him, probably because he's the first boy her age that she was allowed to hang out with other than her brother. Considering that this dialogue is omitted and replaced with other, more platonic lines if you're playing as Celine, the female protagonist, I think Game Freak definitely wanted to imply some sort of romantic interest towards Elio. 
Gengar is Clefable Shadow. This is the quintessential Pokemon conspiracy theory, making it surprised that it's in Layer 2, not Layer 1. But fans were quick to point out the similarities in shape between the two Pokemon, with them almost being the opposite of each other. I mean, they're opposite typings, Normal and Ghost, at least before Generation 6. So yeah, the similar body type made people think that Gengar is Clefable's Shadow or Clefable's Ghost. Honestly, I just think that it's Ken Sugimori recycling Pokemon body shapes when designing the original 151, but I guess this is a valid theory. As you'll see in the future, there are a bunch of theories connecting the Gengar line to other Pokemon. Meltan Home Region Almost every Pokemon has a home region, and even if they're extraterrestrial or extra-dimensional, we still know that they come from outer space or another reality. Well, except for one line. Meltan is quite the interesting Pokemon. You see, it's the only Pokemon ever to first be introduced in Pokemon Go, and as far as I know, it's still the only way you can get it. In Pokemon Home, Meltan and its evolution, Melmetal, are the only Pokemon not to have any description under the region value, with the text saying unknown. The only information we get about it is that in the Pokemon World's history from Mel Metal's Pokedex entry in Sword, which says that distant lands have legends of Gigantamax Mel Metal. Some people say that Meltan, being from Pokemon Go, makes its home region technically our world, and that's as good as an explanation as any since I don't think the Meltan line will ever receive the spotlight again. Omniscient Slowpoke Slowpoke are known for being kind of dumb, right? I mean, it's a Pokemon's whole gimmick. But that's strange. Slowpoke is a psychic type, normally psychic types are smart. So what if Slowpoke isn't dumb, but rather the smartest Pokemon ever? What if it was omniscient, it knows everything? You see, since Slowpoke is actually aware of everything, it's bombarded with so much information and wisdom that it's overwhelmed, and as such, remains sluggish. When Shelder bites either the tail or head of a Slowpoke, causing it to evolve, we know that the Shelder are actually injecting toxins into the now Slowbro or Slow King. These toxins numb the thoughts of the Slowbro or Slow King. However, the Slowpoke are no longer burdened by infinite knowledge, and they become more powerful and are actually able to use their intelligence. Rainbow Rocket Gestus Killed N Rainbow Rocket is an evil team introduced in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. This was an organization consisting of evil team leaders from other dimensions, where they actually succeeded in their goals. Of course, while most of them are typical world-destroying comical evil, Gestus is a lot more sinister and subdued, at least in his goals. He created a grassroots Pokemon liberation program to disarm any resistance towards him, and then, after being the only powerful trainer left, he would use one of the legendary dragons to rule as King of Unova. However, he used his son N as a figurehead of the movement, and even had him awaken a legendary dragon, as Gestus probably couldn't do it himself. But it was known that Gestus fully intended to eliminate N to take the dragon for himself. A fun little detail that plays into this is that the moveset of Gestus's high dragon in black and white, Dragon Pulse, Surf, Focus Blast, and Fire Blast, has a super effective move against all of N's Pokemon, including the legendary dragon. His plan was to have N defeat the player, and then use Hydreigon to eliminate N's team, and N himself probably, taking the legendary dragon from him. Of course, in the game's timeline, the player beats N and then gets this, thwarting his plans. But in the timeline the Rainbow Rocket gets this comes from, he succeeds here, meaning he likely both killed the player and N in the world that he came from. Honestly, the worlds of the Rainbow Rocket leaders are fascinating to me, and I wish we got more information about them. Like, what does a world where Lysander succeeded look like? Mega Evolution Hurts Mega Evolution is a fan-favorite gimmick, allowing Pokemon to evolve beyond their final, natural conclusions into new, cool-looking forms. In Generation 6, the generation Mega Evolution was introduced in, Mega Evolution was depicted as a way for Pokemon to go beyond their natural limits and unlock their true potential. It was a good thing unlocked through the bond with their trainers. However, in Generation 7, this attitude changed, at least from Game Freak. We got Pokedex entries from the Mega Evolutions, and a bunch of them seemed strangely negative. There was a lot of emphasis placed on how Mega Evolution hurt the Pokemon. Here's all the examples I could find of negative Mega Evolution Dex entries. Mega Alakazam loses all strength in its muscles in favor of a powerful mind. Mega Gengar loses all sense of relationships and loyalty, instead trying to kill anyone and everyone it sees, including its trainer. Mega Kangaskhan's baby grows up, but since the baby only cares about fighting, it makes its mother sick with worry. 
Mega Pinsir's dex entry talks about how it excitedly pierces enemies with its horns before shredding them into pieces, which isn't necessarily negative for Pinsir, but still oddly graphic for Pokemon. I guess he's having a fun time. Mega Evolution stresses Gyarados out tremendously, affecting its brain to the point where it can only lash out in violence. The Pokedex straight up states that Mega Evolution is a burden on Aerodactyl, causing it immense pain. Mega Ampharos turns into a dragon and grows back its wool. Yeah, it's a rare example of Mega Evolution that doesn't seem to hurt the Pokemon, so don't feel bad about Mega Evolving your Ampharos. The energy Mega Evolution gives Caesar is too much after some time, causing it to literally start melting if left in its Mega form for too long. Mega Evolution gives Heracross lots of strength, but after turning back into its normal form, there is a terrible soreness in its muscles. Mega Houndoom's body generates so much heat that it's literally starting to melt its claws and tail, which is very painful for Houndoom. Mega Tyranitar's back splits open due to the excess energy, and it's implied to be in so much pain that it can't even hear its trainer's commands anymore, only operating on instinct. Mega Mawile is another example of a Mega Evolution that doesn't seem to hurt the Pokemon, it just says that its two jaws thrash violently, which doesn't seem to be a big change from normal Mawile. Mega Manectric builds up so much electricity in its body that it irritates it, and it's too much for Manectric to control. Mega Banette's cursing power is so amplified that it spills out of its body, cursing everyone around it indiscriminately. Mega Absol hates fighting, so it despises being forced into its mega form for battling. Mega Garchomp's arms and wings melt into sides, sending it so mad with rage that it swings these sides around wildly. Mega Lucario loses all empathy towards its opponents and beats them without mercy. Once again, not necessarily too negative for Lucario itself, but it's still worded negatively. Mega Slowbro causes the shelter eating Slowbro's tail to grow and start eating Slowbro's whole body, not just its tail. Slowbro itself doesn't seem to care though. When Mega Evolving, the jewel on Sableye's chest grows and rips out of its skin. The yellow marks on Mega Sharpedo are scars from older battle that ripped open after Mega Evolution, causing it, and I quote, sharp pain and suffering. Mega Evolution breaks Glalie's jaw, causing it irritation as it cannot close its mouth anymore. Mega Salamence undergoes lots of stress when its two wings become deformed, resulting in a brutal rampage where it will attack anything by slicing them with its wing, including its trainer. For these rampages, Mega Salamence is known as the Blood-Soaked Crescent. Mega Metagross becomes so smart and cruel and will resort to any method, no matter how unethical, to win. And finally, we have Mega Lopani, which just likes to fight, so not too bad there. So yeah, as you saw, the vast majority of Mega Evolution seem to hurt the Pokemon undergoing it, with the Dex entries going out of their way to describe how bad Mega Evolution is. Some people claim that Game Freak knew that they wouldn't give any new Pokemon Megas, or even include Mega Evolutions in new games, so they added these Dex entries as almost an in-game justification for removing them. Man-Made Pokemon Aren't man-made Pokemon strange? Like, how do they come to life and specifically get classified as Pokemon? I mean, it makes sense that animals and even spirits to an extent can be Pokemon, as they are naturally occurring. Also, biological creatures created by humans also aren't strange. It makes sense that Ditto would escape confinement and multiply in the wild, and Genesect is a modified Pokemon that are limited in number. However, what people often get confused about are the completely mechanical Pokemon, such as the Magnemite and Clink family. How do these magnets, screws, and gears come to life and populate the wild? I mean, you can say that these aren't man-made, but rather natural creatures that are just made of metal and look like human creations. But even this doesn't explain all of them, as we know Pokemon like Porygon are just straight up man-made and even made within the digital realm, so I'm not even sure how it can come to life in the real world. Now I can go into a super convoluted explanation about how certain man-made objects can come to life and can be considered Pokemon, but the correct answer here is that Pokemon are monsters and often monsters include inanimate, man-made objects come to life. Pokemon is no different in that trope. I don't think there was ever any expectation that Pokemon had to be rooted in biological reality. If you really did want an in-universe explanation, it could be that already existing Pokemon adapted using the new materials humans created. For example, we know that Voltorb and Electrode used to be seeds before the modern age, and then adapted to look closer to modern Pokeballs, losing their grass type in the process or they could be ghosts or spirits inhabiting man-made objects. And even if some of them aren't ghost types, it stands to reason, just like how not all dragons are dragon type, not all ghosts are ghost type, especially if they possess another object. Or maybe infinity energy just sometimes brings man-made objects to life. 
Ruins of Alf Transmissions. In Heart Gold and Salt Silver, if you tune your radio in one of the Ruins of Alf chambers, you will start to hear what is known as mysterious transmissions. These transmissions contain distorted cries of Ho-Oh, as well as the sound of the Azir flute, and listening to them increases the chances of you finding a new unknown variant. It is likely that your radio is somehow picking up on the communications between the unknown, and playing back the noise is what causes the unknown to appear to you. Celestica People Disappearance The Celestica people were the ancient people of Sinnoh, existing thousands of years before even the events of Legends Arceus. However, according to the old verses, the civilization suddenly fell into decline at some point in the past, leaving only behind the ruins and the temple. These were the original people of Sinnoh, with the ancestors of the Diamond and Pearl clans later migrating to the land and adopting some of the traditions of the now-gone Celestica people. However, what exactly caused its disappearance? In one of the old verses, it states that the decline of the civilization was caused by something leaving. Quote, Once it shone upon us all, with all the warmth of welcome sun, but now we weep, to grief we fall, starved of light, now it has gone. And some they go, despair withal, in search of it they reel and run. They quit their hearths, abandon hall, and leave our lands to be undone. This thing seems to have acted as a source of light for the Celestica people, maybe in dark times like in an ice age. And I do have a theory about what this thing might be, and I'll explain about it in the next entry. Alder's ancestor is the legendary hero. In various Diamond and Pearl clan huts, we can see portraits of various important characters in the clan's history. While we see portraits of what are obviously the clan founders, we also see a one figure in both of the clans, this man who looks a lot like Alder. Now we don't actually know that he's the ancient hero since there's nothing that confirms this, and it would admittedly be strange if the ancient hero that predates the clans would have portraits in them. It is possible that this guy was the leader of the two clans combined before they split. However, considering that both clans also respect the ancient hero, it is possible that this person is the ancient hero. And well, we know that in Legends Arceus, ancestors usually use the same Pokemon or type of Pokemon as their descendants, and Alder's ace is a Volcarona. Volcarona's dex entries emphasize how ancient peoples worshipped it as a god, seeing it as a replacement for the sun. One specifically states how in cold parts of the world, it is revered as an embodiment of the sun, as it protected people from the cold. Hisui, or Sinnoh, is the coldest region, so it's very likely that the ancient Celestic people worshipped Volcarona as a sun god, protecting them from the cold, which may have been harsher in the past. Also, for some extra evidence, another dex entry states that when volcanic ash darkened the atmosphere, Volcarona's fire served as a replacement for the sun, and we know Sinnoh has a volcano, Stark Mountain, so maybe in the past, Stark Mountain erupted, covering the sky in ash, making the Hisui region even more cold than it actually was. In this time, Volcarona, maybe even the hero's Volcarona, served as a replacement sun for the Celestica people, making the people worship it. However, as we know now, Volcarona no longer exists in Hisui, meaning that at some point in the past they left the region, causing the decline of the Celestica people. Ancient Kalos War So in the comments of the previous layer of this iceberg, I saw a lot of people talking about how I cited a Pokemon war that Lieutenant Surge likely would have fought in likely did not exist, or at the very least wasn't as large a conflict that many other interpretations of the theory would have you believe. And there were some people who said, but no, the Pokemon war did exist, X and Y literally talks about one in the story of the game. And I don't mean to be rude, but I'm just wondering if they even watched the video or thought critically about this for one second. The Kalos War in X and Y took place over 3,000 years ago. I highly doubt Lieutenant Surge here in his modern camo is a veteran of that war, unless Xerneas' ultimate weapon turned him immortal like AZ, but I have a hunch that isn't the case. The hypothetical Pokemon War I talked about in that entry was something that would have happened in their equivalent of 1990, not 1000 BC. With that out of the way, let's talk about the Kalos War itself. The Kalos War is a war talked about extensively in the dialogue of Pokemon X and Y. Of course, we know that one of the sides of the war was a side ruled by AZ, but we are not actually sure as to who the other side was. I thought that it was a civil war between a faction led by the King AZ and a faction led by his younger brother, as in-game lore tells us that the two did fight each other. However, the dialogue and Junichi Masuda himself says that Kalos won the war against another region. Now, it's possible that the forces led by AZ's brothers seceded from Kalos and formed their own shortly independent region. 
In the game, it tells us that AZ's brother led a group of people who didn't like how wealthy Kalos had become, and how that wealth was not being distributed evenly among the people, which immediately makes me think of the French Revolution, even though this war would take place like 2,800 years before when the French Revolution would take place in our timeline. But this war grew so fierce that AZ sent his own Floette into battle, who ended up passing away. Overwhelmed by grief, AZ built the ultimate weapon, a device using the life energy of either Xerneas or Veltal to bring back his Floette, as well as inflict devastating revenge upon the opposing forces. AZ fired the weapon, bringing back Floette, but after Floette realized the devastation AZ had caused, it left him. AZ, now both depressed and immortal due to the weapon, disappears from Kalos. His younger brother, horrified by the destruction AZ caused, removes all selfish intent from his heart and simply helps the people rebuild. The people support him to be their new leader, and his brother creates a new lineage of callous leaders who hide the ultimate weapon, keeping its location a family secret so that nobody is able to use it again. Until the last living descendant of AZ's brother, a man named Lysander, decides to use it to accomplish his own selfish goals. So that is essentially the in-game story summarized. However, I don't think it's the full story. If the war was just between AZ and his brother, I don't think there would be such emphasis on how the war was with another region. So let's take a look at some candidates. The first theory is that AZ was a king who actually invaded Kalos, rather than being a king of Kalos by birthright. This is based on a post on the Bulbapedia forums by the user Element Collector one In this image of the Kalos war, we're able to see humans. Taking a look at their helmets, we see the ones on the left resembling Greek or Roman helmets, while the ones on the right resemble medieval French or German helmets. Of course, we see the Floette fighting alongside the people with the Mediterranean helmets, meaning that AZ was on their side, not the quote-unquote native collosion side. And then you could hand-wave the story of the brothers into this too. AZ was the king of an unknown Mediterranean region that ruled Kalos, kind of like how the Roman Empire conquered a part of Gaul or ancient France. However, there was an increasing disparity between his ruling class and the lower class, many of whom were native Colossians. So his brother, seeking opportunity, rallied the remaining Kalos forces, as well as possibly seeking the help of some ancient Germany-inspired region, and fought against AZ's occupying army. It's certainly possible. And I just wanted to say, if AZ is really from an ancient Greek-inspired region, that means the name AZ is just a westernized translation of his real name, which would be... Alpha Omega. The second theory is a bit more popular, and it's that the war was fought against Galar, with Unova being involved. I like this theory a little bit more, because it's more in line with actual history, taking inspiration from how interconnected both the American and French revolutions were. As we know, Galar is based on Britain, and anyone who knows their history knows that before the 1900s, Britain and France were basically sworn enemies. So of course Galar would be culprit number one for uh, enemy of Kalos. And there's a strong possibility Unova was involved too. We already established that AZ's war seems to take inspiration from the French Revolution, and we know that the French Revolution was directly caused by the American Revolution. And Unova is based on America, specifically New York, which was one of the 13 original colonies that fought against Britain. So here's what I think happened. Unova and Galar get into a war, similar to how New York, as part of the independent states, got into a war against the British Empire. Unova asks Kalos for help, and Kalos agrees. Eventually, Unova and Kalos end up winning the war against Galar. However, the war increases the disparity between the rich and poor in Kalos, leading to AZ's brother leading a people's revolution against his older brother. This could be around the same time the twin heroes of Unova had their ideological split, leading to the original dragon breaking apart to become Rushram and Zekra. This matches how, in the real world, the American founding fathers were also ideologically split on whether or not to support the French Revolution. One brother believes in ideals, meaning he was on AZ's side, because he supported how AZ kept making technology to create a better future. The other brother supported truth, or AZ's brother, because he saw the truth of AZ's rule, that the people were suffering under him. AZ fires a weapon to bring back his floette and disappears, meaning AZ's younger brother wins the war. It's also no worth noting that the darkest day of Galar also happened around 3,000 years ago, the same time as the ancient Kalos War. While I don't think the two are ever stated to be related, the fact that Game Freak used the same year for both events must mean something. Maybe the firing of the ultimate weapon caused Eternatus to awake and rampage through Galar. Brock and Ivy Professor Ivy is an anime original character introduced in Season 2 of the anime. Of course, being a beautiful woman, Brock does what he always does and develops a massive crush on her. 
However, Ivy has Brock especially enamored, to the point where he leaves Ash and Misty just to stay with Ivy. However, by the beginning of Season 3, Brock had returned to be with Ash and Misty. When asking him about Ivy, Brock just like completely shuts down, curling up into a ball and refusing to talk. Of course, Brock has been rejected by many, many women throughout the course of the series, yet no rejection has ever caused him to act like this. While we never get a definitive answer for this behavior, there are several theories. One states that he simply just got rejected, but maybe Ivy was particularly harsh, or Brock had fallen for her harder than he did for other women, meaning that the rejection hit worse. Another theory states that he was actually able to get into a relationship with her, but it fell apart, maybe due to the maturity gap. Brock had a bunch of schoolboy crushes, but was unable to tr transform those surface level feelings into a meaningful relationship. And of course, a breakup would hurt more than a simple rejection by a crush. However, the closest we get to a canonical answer is from the head series writer for the first few seasons of the anime, Takeshi Shudo. In volume 2 of a book series he wrote called Pocket Monsters The Animation, Shudo says the reason why Brock was so traumatized was because Ivy is a lesbian. Yeah, that's probably not what you were expecting. Shudo says that since Brock realized that there was no chance whatsoever that Ivy would ever like him due to her sexual orientation, he took it much harder than usual. Honestly, the logic here seems a bit backwards to me. Like, if someone's brain is literally wired to never be attracted to you because of your gender, getting rejected by them isn't personal at all. However, if someone is attracted to your gender, but you still get rejected by them, the implication here is that it's something about you personally that they don't like. And while this isn't indicative of you being bad, it sure can feel like that. So like I said, the logic is a bit dubious, and to be honest, the Pocket Monster books are incredibly dubious in general. There's an entry much later down in the iceberg which is about these books specifically, so I'll save specific discussion about them until then. While Takeshi Shudo was a legend, he had some crazy ideas about what he thought the Pokemon anime should be, and this idea he had about Ivy is probably the tamest of them all. However, in the end, the explanation that Ivy is a lesbian is the most legitimate, so that's that. Acerola's Mimikyu So Acerola has a special Mimikyu named Mimikin. Beyond being a shiny, this Mimikyu is just straight up dead. Yeah, all Mimikyu are ghost type, but they're still quote unquote alive. Mimikin is dead and an actual ghost, a ghost of a ghost. This is why Mimikin is able to float around and pass through walls, stuff an actual Mimikyu cannot do. Once again, this is a strange concept, but I guess there is some logic to it. Ghost Pokemon aren't all spirits, some just have properties associated with ghosts. So Mimikin is a deceased spirit of a ghost type that was once alive. Fantina's home region. Fantina is a gym leader in the Generation 4 games. She tells the player that Sinnoh is in her home region, and she also speaks with an accent. In the English versions of the game, she has a French accent. However, in the Japanese versions, she speaks with an English accent. Of course, most people assume that she's from Kalos due to her accent and the fact that her name Fantina is derivative of the French name Fantine. However, I'm sure Japanese players don't have this theory because she doesn't have any French connections in the Japanese versions of the game as her name is Marissa there. However, I do think that she is from Kalos, as her big personality trait is that she's into fashion, and fashion is a huge part of the Kalos games. Drasna is from Celestic Town. Now we kind of have like an opposite situation, somebody in Kalos who was originally from Sinnoh. From what I remember, Drasna herself isn't actually from Celestic Town though, but rather her grandparents. Her dialogue states that her grandparents were from Celestic Town, and as a little girl, they told her stories of Dialga and Palkia. These stories inspired Drasna to train dragons, leading to her becoming a strong dragon-type trainer, strong enough to be a member of the Elite Four. This also implies that Drasna is one of the few descendants of the Celestica people. Thinking about it, it's strange that we didn't get a reference to Drasna's ancestry in Legends Arceus. Honestly, it would make more sense if Liam's character was replaced by somebody who was Drasna's ancestor instead of Clay's ancestor. I mean, Liam uses a Gumi, a Colosian dragon type. It was like that role was made for Drasna's ancestor. Agatha and Bertha Relation Another entry about Legends Arceus, we have a potential family relationship between Agatha and Bertha implied in Legends Arceus. Now, Agatha and Bertha are both old ladies in the Elite Four. And apparently, according to Game Freak, all old ladies are related because they were given a common ancestor in Legends Arceus. The character Charm, a bandit, shares a striking resemblance to both Agatha and Bertha. Additionally, characters in Legends Arceus tend to use the same Pokemon as their descendants, and Charm actually has two Pokemon, Gengar and Rhydon. Of course, these are references to the aces of Agatha and Bertha, 
Agatha's ace is a Gengar, and Bertha's ace is a Rhyperior, Rhydon's evolved form. So yeah, I'd say that these two old ladies are long lost cousins. Fused Beasts and Musketeers In the Scarlet and Violet books, we see future and past paradox Pokemon. The past paradox form seems to be a fusion of all three of the Johto legendary beasts, while the future paradox form seems to be a fusion of all the Unovan swords of justice. However, in reality, while the past and future forms are of the beasts and swords, they are not fused. There are three past paradox Pokemon, each corresponding to a beast, and three future paradox Pokemon, each corresponding to a sword. Once again, this is likely due to the books not being completely true, and how the paradox Pokemon are created from imagination, so people likely imagine past and future forms for all the Pokemon, not just fused versions. Immortal Volo So Volo says that in order to reach his goal, he was willing to wait years, decades, and centuries even. While we previously talked about how this may be him alluding to being a time traveler, this could also be him admitting that he's immortal. It's not out of the question, there are other immortal humans in Pokemon, and Volo being immortal has enough evidence backing it if you really believe in it. Sinjo Location Sinjo is a region that was explored in a special event of Heart Gold and Soul Silver. It's kind of like how the Scarlet and Violet DLC took us to a part of a region called Kitsukami, except our exploration of the Sinjo region was much more restricted, relegated to some ruins. Now we know that Sinjo is north of Johto, and that it was an ancient civilization that mixed aspects of the Sinoan celestial culture and the culture of ancient Johto, hence the name being a combination of the two regions. Considering Sinnoh is a cold region, we can assume that the Sinjo region is south of Sinnoh. This also makes sense considering the real world locations the regions are based off of. There is a huge chunk of Japan above Johto and below Sinnoh where the Sinjo region could be located, so I'd say it's somewhere there. XY Power Plant Locked Doors In Pokemon X and Y, one of the biggest mysteries are the locked doors to the power plant. While we were able to explore a part of the power plant, it was basically just one room, and there was clearly more to be explored. The doors in the desert also specifically tell you that they are locked, implying that they were supposed to be unlocked sometime in the future, maybe after getting a key in an event. Or if Pokemon Z was ever going to be a thing, maybe they'd be unlocked in that game. Personally, I think that it was supposed to house a Vulcanian encounter. I know that the Pokedex says that Vulcanian lives in mountains, but Vulcanian is the steam Pokemon, and steam is basically used in all power plants, so it would be a perfect place for Vulcanian to hang out. Also, Vulcanian was only able to be obtained legally in those games in a Japan-only event, so I'd hope that they at least had a plan to distribute it globally. It would be perfect if the locked doors led to Vulcanian, so I'm assuming that's what they were for. Grand Oak Professor Oak Connection Grand Oak is a character in the Pokemon Home software. He's not too important, he's basically just supposed to show you the ropes of how the software works. However, it's implied that he's supposed to be a Professor Oak from another universe, his speech he gives about his dream of completing a national Pokedex with every Pokemon and needing our help to do it mir mirrors Professor Oak's speech about the Pokedex in the Generation 1 games. Also, Grand Oak allows us to choose one of the Kanto starters with a hidden ability, just like how Professor Oak gives us a Kanto starter, albeit with their regular abilities. And they also look like the same person. So yeah, Grand Oak is a Professor Oak from a universe where we wear much cooler clothes and give out hidden ability starters. I wish I was from that universe. Nanu and Giovanni Past Apparently in the Pokemon anime, Nanu and Giovanni know each other, but it's never explained how. Considering Nanu used to be an influential officer of the International Police, who we know were investigating Team Rocket in the Gen 1 games, it's possible that they knew about each other through this investigation, being leading figures on the two opposing sides. However, I don't think this is the case. The way they interact implies that they're friends who drifted apart, not old enemies. I mean, Giovanni literally calls Nanu on the phone and refers to him as an old friend, and Giovanni was surprised to learn that he was a police officer, implying that he wasn't when they knew each other, and that it would be out of character for the old Nanu to become a cop. Throughout both the games and anime, there are hints that Nanu had a shady, even criminal past. He's a dark type user, which in Japanese is the evil type, showing that he isn't really supposed to be a stand-up officer. So I think he was definitely a criminal in the past, maybe even a member of Team Rocket. However, he cleaned up his act and left crime behind, going to Alola and becoming a cop, using his experience with criminal organizations to fight them more effectively. Honestly, I think that this was a big missed opportunity in the Let's Go games. Those games were Kanto remakes that featured Alolan forms alongside named characters from Alola. It would be super cool if we saw a younger Nanu as a Team Rocket admin, but after the player beats him, he realizes the error of his ways and leaves the organization. 
Later in the game, he could also be the character who trades you an Alolan Meowth in exchange for a Cantonian one, a callback to how it gives out Alolan Meowth in a Gen 7 games. Now I'm honestly getting mad that they didn't do this, it's just too perfect. But yeah, it's likely that Giovanni and Nanu were criminal friends back during Gen 1. I mean, they both do have a fondness for Persian, just different forms of Persian. Atom Bomb Victini Victini is a strange Pokemon. Its design was initially based on apple slices, very innocent, but fan theories suggest that it could be based on an atomic bomb, specifically the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Anything but innocent. Looking at its Pokedex entries, there are two things that they highlight. One, they talk about the near-infinite energy this Pokemon creates within its body. So we have this really small body that has the potential to create huge amounts of energy. Sounds exactly like a nuclear bomb, which are pretty small but can release energy in amounts enough to level cities. The Pokedex entries also talk about how Victini is a victory Pokemon, bringing victory to its trainer. This can be a reference to how the atom bombs were the key to America establishing total victory over Japan in World War II. Speaking of America, Victini is a Pokemon native to the Unova region, the Pokemon equivalent of the United States of America. Additionally, it can be found in Castelia City, which is based off Manhattan. This could be alluding to the Manhattan Project, the secret government project which resulted in the creation of the atom bomb. Additionally, Victini looks like a small child, maybe alluding to the name of the bomb Little Boy. There's also a whole other aspect to this connection that I'm not really sure I want to include, but I guess I will cover it just to cover all bases. Victini looking like a child could also allude to the child victims of the atomic bomb. Now, this isn't coming out of nowhere. Some people in the Pokemon community think that Victini's name not only alludes to victory, but also victim. In Hiroshima, there is a monument known as the Children's Peace Monument. This monument honors Sadako Sasaki, a young girl who survived the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, but died 10 years later at the age of 12 from leukemia, which was caused by the radiation poisoning she suffered. She's known for folding 1,000 paper cranes, being inspired by a legend that folding 1,000 origami cranes would grant you a wish. The monument honors her wish for a world without nuclear weapons. I wouldn't have included this in this entry except for one thing. To bring it back to Victini, the monument features a red V-shape, which is almost identical to the design on top of Victini's head. They're very similar, and considering that Game Freak would be aware of this famous Japanese memorial, I can see how there could be a connection here. So yeah, I do think that there is a connection between Victini and nuclear weapons, but to be fair, there are a bunch of other design inspirations for Victini I didn't talk about. Also, while researching this entry, I came across another theory that the Reggies are also based on nuclear weapons. It's actually not an entry in the full iceberg, so if you guys want me to cover this theory at the beginning of the next layer, please let me know down in the comments. Women's Secret In one of the Pokemon games, you encounter a swimmer with the dialogue, If I'm wearing a bikini, where do I put my Pokeballs? Teehee, Women's Secret. Now, this is obviously an adult joke, implying that she stuffs her bikini top, or puts her Pokeballs in a place that I can't talk about on YouTube. While this would be where the entry ends, I found a more interesting conspiracy surrounding this. This quote isn't real. It's strange to think about since the women's secret is such a popular meme. But yeah, if you do the basic amount of research, we realize that this was never actually said. Inspection of the image also clearly shows that the text bubble is showing three lines at once, when in the games they never show more than two lines at once. Although it is possible that the person who made the image edited it slightly just to have all the text show up in one picture. Also, Game Freak spells Pokeball as two separate words, not as one word as shown in the image. There were other people who questioned the validity of the screenshot, and I actually found a post showing that the swimmer said something else. But it's possible this post wasn't showing the full dialogue. Also, there were people saying that while the dialogue wasn't from black and white specifically, trainers in another game said it. But nobody could agree from which game the dialogue was from. Some people said X and Y, other people said Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire, some said the original Ruby and Sapphire, while one person even said it was from Heart Gold and Soul Silver. So what better way to finally put an end to this mystery and confusion than to find this NPC in game? While I don't want to do a playthrough of Black and White until I got to that point, I did skip through a 28 hour long play by FC Playthroughs to hopefully find this trainer, and I did. A battle with Swimmer Joyce on Route 17 is initiated, and before she says, I learned all the good points on my Alola Mola by swimming with Pokemon, I will show off its strength. This matches the post we saw earlier. However, it's what she says afterwards that interests me. After beating her in battle, she says, I'm a girl with everything. Well, everything but a place to put my Pokeballs. So yeah, the meme image is not from the official game. 
but her losing dialogue is interesting. It has a similar subject matter to the meme image, both being about not having a place to store their Pokeballs due to their clothes. However, the official game leaves it at that, while the meme image specifically implies the adult women's secret. So maybe someone saw the original dialogue, thought of the joke, and then fabricated the meme image to spread around. That would be a logical assumption, except for the fact that a bunch of people seem to remember this dialogue from playing the game. Is it just a simple case of a bunch of people misremembering? Well, I don't think so. You see, I think I've come to the bottom of this mystery. Pokemon Black and White were not like modern games, which are released globally on the same date. Black and White released in Japan in September 2010, while they released in Europe, America, and Australia almost six months later in March 2011. Of course, this was an insanely long time to wait if you're an English-speaking fan, so some people decided to make their own English versions. Of course, right after the Japanese release of the games, the game ROMs were illegally leaked online for anyone to download, play, and modify for themselves. So before the end of September 2010, fans were working on modifying the game files to create an English translation of the game, utilizing people who understood both the languages to translate the text from Japanese to English. And in just a couple days, a full English version of the game was available to play. So of course many English-speaking fans were quick to play this ROM. That means the dialogue from the meme image was probably taken from the game, just this unofficially translated version. The unofficial translators would translate differently from the official English localizers, which makes sense as to why the dialogue itself is different while the subject is similar. And since the unofficial translations were released months earlier, this meme image was probably spread around before the official versions of the game came out, which resulted in people later thinking that it was part of the actual official game. So yeah, sorry to burst your bubble, but the women's secret line isn't official, it's fan-made, just not in the way you might initially think. Champion Oak. Was Professor Oak in Champion? Well, if you're a fan of the Pokemon Adventures manga, the answer is a resounding yes. I mean, he says so himself. But is this the case in the games? Well, I do think so. We already know that he used to be a trainer who was on the level of Agatha, an Elite Four member, so he's definitely one of the top trainers of Kanto. The strongest piece of evidence is that only champions and former champions are allowed into the Hall of Fame. They don't even let friends or loved ones in to celebrate your victory. Oak explicitly says in the games that the Hall of Fame is for champions only, and then he leads you in. This definitely makes me think that he used to be champion back in the day. Also, it seems that in Red and Blue a battle against Professor Oak was intended, but never actually implemented. This battle can be triggered using a glitch, and Oak has a high-level team of Tauros, Arcanine, Executor, Gyarados, and the starter weak against yours. This shows that he is capable of being a champion-level trainer. Mewtwo's Birth So we always talk about Mewtwo as a clone of Mew. While this is said in the movies, in the games it actually says that Mew gave birth to Mewtwo. Now, I choose to believe that this dialogue used birth as a metaphor for Mewtwo's creation using Mew's DNA, rather than Mew actually giving birth to Mewtwo, which I don't even know how that would even work. Or maybe Mew gave birth to another Mew, and then the scientist performed genetic manipulation on that second Mew, transforming it while it was still alive, and turning it into Mewtwo. Misty likes Ash. I mean, sure, I guess. I don't think anybody would really dispute this claim in regards to the anime. The Iceberg mentions a song from the anime called Misty's Song, which is a love song sung from Misty by Ash. There's no two ways around it. However, this only ever appears in the English version of the show and doesn't show up in the original Japanese in any way, shape, or form. So it's possible four kids wanted to imply a romantic relationship between the two because it's four kids, but this never ended up becoming actual canon. I don't care whatsoever because I really don't want to spend my time shipping literal ten-year-olds. Sixth Time Gear Ah, uh, we finally get to an entry about Mystery Dungeon, specifically Pokemon Mystery Dungeon 2, Explorers of Sky, which, I'm not ashamed to say this, is the best thing to come out of the entire Pokemon franchise. So I'm going to try and not explain the entire plot of the game here, but to extremely summarize, a big part of the game involves these things called Time Gears from various dungeons across the world. Time Gears can be put into this place called Temporal Tower in order to stop it from collapsing. Temporal Tower has five indents to place time gears in, and we see these five time gears from across the map, specifically the Fogbound Lake, Underground Lake, Crystal Lake, Limestone Cavern, and Tree Shroud Forest. However, when your partner is explaining time gears to you, they talk about a gear located underneath a volcano, which we would know as the Dark Crater Pit. However, in the game, no time gear is located there. 
Of course, we don't access this area until the post-game, so we don't know if there was one there before the events of the endgame, but it's weird that they specifically mention a time gear here that doesn't appear. So there's a couple of theories. The simplest is that it was just a rumor. Your partner is no expert on time gears when they tell you about them, and they're only repeating rumors spread by other people. After all, there are only five indents at Temporal Tower. There would be only five time gears. But also, in the game, Grovile uses the term five necessary time gears, which implies that there could be more time gears around the world, but only five are required for Temporal Tower. Another theory thinks that Darkrai somehow took the time gear and absorbed its power to gain time traveling abilities and send Dialga down a spiral of madness. And Dialga, before fully succumbing to insanity, created the five indents for the rest of the time gears, hoping that someone else would come along and save the tower. But no matter what you believe in, you can say that this dungeon contains a lot of mystery. Villain Gita Gita is the underwhelming champion of the Paldea region. Despite calling herself the top champion, her team is so bad that it's hard to believe she's a challenge for anybody. However, she isn't just a champion, she's specifically the boss of the entire league, a role she explicitly has that other champions aren't really said to have. This gives her a lot of power over the entire Paldea region, and it's known that she's rich and holds a lot of secrets. Additionally, gym leaders and elite four members don't seem to like her. In fact, they all basically have nothing good to say about her behind her back. Additionally, when first exploring Area Zero, Nomona points out the Glamora specifically, talking about how one of them is Gita's ace, and how that they were instrumental in spreading terrestrialization around Paldea. So yeah, we have a blank slate character who is hyped up as super important, and is disliked by everybody who knows her except for her fans, and is also connected with the extremely shady government exclusion zone where people died in an incident that was covered up. I think we have a villain on our hands. I'm not exactly sure what her motivation would be, but it seems like the game is setting her up to be a villain. Maybe she purposefully had a weak team in her champion fight to gauge the player's skills, and later her final team would be much stronger. The Indigo Disc DLC will release soon, and this video will probably be uploaded around that time. I think we will be returning to Area Zero in the story of that DLC, so let's see if Gita will return as a villain. I mean, the trailer, the final trailer just came out today, and we saw Gita in it, so maybe this theory is true. Gen 1 Muna In the Generation 1 games, an NPC named Picnicker Carol makes a comment about some of the Pokemon nearby. She says, the Pokemon here are so chunky, there should be a pink one with a floral pattern. Of course, there are no such Pokemon that fit this description in the Generation 1 games, so maybe this trainer was ill-informed, or maybe it was a reference to a cut Pokemon, but if that was the case, it doesn't make sense as to why they included a similar line in Fire Red and Leaf Green, the remakes that released in the early 2000s. However, a Pokemon did eventually release that fit this bill, Muna. It's chunky, pink, and has a floral pattern. Carol is describing Muna exactly. So was Muna planned since Gen 1, but stayed unreleased until Gen 5? Well, Ken Sugimori, one of the main people behind Pokemon Designs, did an interview about Gen 5 Designs, and apparently they designed the entire Muna line from scratch right before Gen 5 started proper development. So apparently, no, it was just a massive coincidence. I still think that there was some Pokemon in development that matched this description, but it was scrapped and they never bothered to remove the dialogue, maybe purposefully creating a mystery. Paradox that attacked Arvin in Scarlet and Violet, before the events of the story, Arvid and Mabostiff were attacked by a Paradox Pokemon in Area Zero, leading to Mabostiff becoming gravely injured. Arvin says that he can't recall what Pokemon attacked him. However, we can narrow it down quite a bit. It's probably not Iron Tread's Great Tusk, since we fight them with him, and he would have said something if those were the ones who attacked him. Similarly, none of the Paradoxes we encounter as a group in our first descent into Area Zero would count either, as he would say something about it. A possibility is either Roaring Moon or Iron Valiant. We don't see them in the wild until the post-game, and it makes sense that Arvin would be beat badly by them, since they're the strongest of the non-legendary Paradox Pokemon. However, one thing doesn't line up. Arvin says that he was attacked between Research Stations 1 and 2, while these Pokemon reside way below that. It's possible that one of them made their way up, but unlikely. So the other possibilities are Sandy Shocks and Iron Thorns, or Slitherwing and Iron Moth. And of these possibilities, the latter two are the only ones that spawn in the right area. So I can confidently say that the Paradox Pokemon that attacked Arbin and Mabostiff is Slitherwing if you played Scarlet, and Iron Moth if you played Violet. Additionally, in Scarlet, it makes sense that Mabostiff was so gravely injured if it fought Slitherwing. Slitherwing is a bug fighting type, which has a massive advantage over the dark type Mabostiff. No wonder the poor dog almost died. 
So I think this is the case, unless the DLC reveals it was one of the members of the legendary Paradox trios that did it. Aster Aster is a character who is mentioned in the Delta episode of Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. In the games, we all we know about her is that Xenia swears to her that she would protect Hoenn from the incoming meteor. Later, she reveals to the player that she and Aster used to be super close before Aster died. In the manga, we get more information about Aster. She was the lore keeper of the Draconids before the Demon Corporation killed her in order to get to Rayquaza. Holy shit. Afterwards, uh, Z- afterwards, Zinnia was given the title of lore keeper, although some of the Draconids didn't like this decision, since she wasn't nearly as strong as Aster. Aster was a good friend of Rayquaza, and she also left behind a Noivern after her death. Hassel is Jotonian. Hassel is your art teacher and scholar in Violet, as well as a Dragon Type Elite 4 member. If you do the Hassel's friend side quest, you'll see that Hassel was from a far off land, but didn't want to become the head of a family which specializes in dragon types. He was much more interested in the arts, so he ran off. In this quest, we see one of his relatives come to the academy to try and convince him to return back home, even, l- even lying about his father's health. This family member is wearing a dark blue uniform with an orange cape. This color scheme rem- reminds me of Lance from Johto, who is also part of a family who trains dragons. Makes sense. However, we know that Lance's uniform is a variation of the Hammerlock Gym uniform in Johto, as he trained there when he was younger. So it's doubtful that this is some sort of family uniform color, unless it was changed in like the past 10 years. In fact, the uniform the girl wears in Scarlet and Violet actually resembles Rayhan's uniform more, with the gold and orange being more similar. Also, the skin tone between this relative and Rayhan matches better, although both look nothing like Hassel. So Hassel is probably either from Johto or Galar. You can take your pick. Cosmog is a UB. Cosmog is an Ultra Beast. This is not a theory, more of a fact. The Cosmog lines are Ultra Beasts, considering that they originate from Ultra Space. In fact, if you listen closely, all the Ultra Beasts have the same sound at the end of their cries. All the members of the Cosmog line also have this sound. Detective Pikachu Cannon This is specifically referring to the Detective Pikachu movie. The writers of the movie said that they wrote it to be canon within the anime timeline, meaning that it takes place in the same world as the Pokemon anime. The number one detail that confirms this is the backstory from Mewtwo is the same as the anime backstory, not the game backstory. Another cool detail is that there's a line in the movie that the last time Mewtwo was seen was 20 years ago in Kanto. The Detective Pikachu movie came out in 2019, and Pokemon the movie came out in 1999 meaning that the years match up in real life. Although this breaks the canon established in the 2013 movie Genesect and the Legend Awakened, where Mewtwo also shows up, but I guess that's supposed to be a different Mewtwo entirely, so we can let that slide. But another interesting thing to consider is that if we take Ash's age into consideration, the entire anime takes place over the course of a single year or a similar time frame, meaning that Detective Pikachu movie is a huge time skip from the end of the anime. So even though it wasn't intended, we can come up with a cool theory. Since Ash became world champion at the end of the anime, we can assume that he and his ace Pikachu become super famous across the world. This got a lot more people interested in leaving their Pokemon outside their Pokeballs, and thinking that capturing Pokemon and Pokeballs is immoral, as Ash's Pikachu didn't want that to happen to it. So a lot more people actually left their Pokemon outside their Pokeballs, and 20 years later, most people actually don't use Pokeballs, instead of letting their Pokemon walk alongside them, which is what we see in Rhyme City, the main setting of Detective Pikachu. Although Rhyme City also makes Pokemon battling illegal, which is probably not something that people would do if they were inspired by Ash Ketchum, a champion of battling. But hey, maybe in those 20 years a lot more people decided to treat Pokemon better. Koga tricks the player. In the Generation 1 games, Koga's gym is interesting. Despite being a poison type gym leader, a lot of his trainers use psychic type Pokemon. Also, his gym battle is an invisible maze which is created using invisible barriers a concept associated with the Psychic type. If you knew nothing about the game beforehand, and if you challenged Koga's gym before Sabrina, I wouldn't blame you for thinking it was a Psychic type gym. If you don't talk to the guy at the beginning of the gym, you wouldn't know until you fought Koga himself, who reveals himself to be a master of poison types. Koga is a ninja. Ninjas are masters of deception, and what better way to deceive us than to make us think that his gym was a different type than it actually is? Maybe Game Freak intended for us to be tricked during this battle too, making us lead with a bug type which have an advantage over what we thought was a psychic type gym, only to be met by poison types which in Gen 1 were super effective against bug. This deception may have actually worked if there were any actual good bug type moves in the Gen 1 games, but 
in the final Gen 1 games, there were no good bug type moves, or good bug types for that matter, so nobody was bringing one to a gym. Sada, Turo are Arvin's parents. So yeah, another obvious one. Sada and Turo are Arvin's parents, based on the game you're playing. If you're playing Scarlet, Professor Sada is Arvin's mom, while if you're playing Violet, Professor Turo is Arvin's dad. However, we don't see a version of Turo and Scarlet, or a version of Sada and Violet. It's said that Arvin's other parent passed a long time ago, leaving the remaining parent to neglect poor Arvin. Although it does make you wonder what the alternate versions of Sada and Turo are like. Would they still be scientists obsessed with making a time machine, or would they be normal people and perhaps even a good parent? Other Palette Trainers In the anime, it's well known that Ash was late to getting a starter Pokemon, leaving him with Pikachu. Of course, we know that Gary took Squirtle, but who took Charmander and Bulbasaur? The correct answer is that they weren't important enough to be shown, and just kind of had to exist out of necessity to justify Ash getting Pikachu. It's later said that in the anime, they started out promising, but didn't have the skill to get all 8 badges. But if you want a satisfying answer, we can look at the Adventures manga. In the Kanto portion of the Adventures manga, we have 4 trainers, each of whom has a Kanto starter, although they are different to the starters of their anime counterparts. Ash is a counterpart to Red, who has a Bulbasaur in the manga. Gary is a counterpart to Green, who has a Charmander in the manga. But there are two other trainers, Blue, who has a Squirtle, and Yellow, who has a Pikachu. It's possible that the two missing Pallet Town trainers are the anime counterparts to Blue and Yellow from the manga. Vesa is Spiritomb. And now we have the final entry of Layer 2, Vesa is Spiritomb. In Legends Arceus, this creepy little girl called Vesa gives us the odd keystone, which is used to house Spiritomb. She then tasks us with collecting 107 wisps across the Hisui region. After we do this, she asks you to come with her to the Shrouded Ruins at night. She tells you that she has the final wisp and to close your eyes. Once you open them, she is nowhere to be seen and the final wisp is near you instead. After collecting it, Vesa's disembodied voice says that making us collect the wisps was her final bit of mischief and she asks us not to forget about her. Immediately afterwards, a spirit tomb appears and we can catch it. So yeah, if you know about Spirit Tomb's lore, you know that it's a collection of 108 spirits stored in a vessel. It's pretty obvious that the 108 wisps we collect are the 108 spirits, with Vesa being one of them. In fact, it's likely that Vesa took the form of a little girl to ask you, someone she knows will explore the corners of the Hisuri region, to gather all the wisps in order to make Spirit Tomb whole again. And yeah, she literally wants you to put them all into a vessel, hence her name Vesa. So, yeah, Vesa was part of a spirit tomb that used you to put spirit tomb back together, allowing her to return to her former glory. Pretty fun storyline. With that, layer 2 of the Pokemon Conspiracy Iceberg is done. I know the first part in the series got a lot of views and support, and a lot of you were eagerly waiting for me to release this continuation. I know that there was a bit of a delay, but college really does take a toll on me, so I apologize. But with that being said, if you guys want to see Layer 3 of this iceberg soon, I want to see the same support here as I did with the last video. So make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll sure to get the next part out quickly. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed.